Let's talk about the what, the how, and the why of blockchains slash Web3. In my 25-year career as a computer scientist, I don't think I've ever seen a technology as widely and deeply misunderstood uh, as blockchains and the applications that are being built on top of them. Probably it's a testament um, to the power of first impressions. Uh, I think a lot of viewpoints um, got sort of hardened in the years that followed the initial release uh, of the Bitcoin protocol, uh, which persists to this day. Um, some of those viewpoints, maybe they were semi-accurate, you know, eight or 10 years ago, something like that. Um, but they're definitely not accurate in 2022. We've had many generations of blockchain technologies that have uh, followed in Bitcoin's footsteps. Uh, and also there's been tremendous kind of evolution in our understanding of, of what this technology uh, might be able to achieve. Uh, so what I want to do here is just take really an honest look at this technology uh, in 2022, uh, not through the lens of investing or money or politics, but really just through the lens of my discipline, through the lens of computer science. And I want to tell you what I see when I look at it through that lens. Uh, I like to sort of organize the discussion around the questions of the what, the how, and the why. And um, when it comes to the what, I almost want to think of you know, a technology like blockchains as almost like a computational model. And the what question is, you know, fundamentally, what new functionality does this computational model, does this technology give you that you didn't already have? Okay, so if this technology gives you a superpower, what is it? So I'll tell you the answer, or my current answer for the, the what of blockchains on the next slide. Um, for an analogy, you could imagine asking the what question about the internet, right? So fundamentally, what is it that the internet accomplishes? You know, you could argue about that, but let me suggest that um, the essential functionality of the internet is to enable the near instantaneous transfer of digital information between any two points on the globe. And I think if you walked up to somebody on the street and you sort of told them that sentence, most people would sort of say, yeah, that's sort of roughly what I thought the internet was, was all about. Let me point out that the, if you think about a technology stack with the lowest level stuff on the bottom and sort of the user facing applications on the top, the what question lies squarely in the middle where the rubber hits the road, where the actual system being built meets the, the user facing applications that are built on top of that system. So the how and the why questions then concern the bottom and the top part of that stack. How, you know, so there we say, okay, it's all fine and good to kind of write down conceptually some computing functionality you might like to have, but then the question is, is that actually realizable with existing technology? Can you actually build a system that fulfills those promises? And if so, how would you do it? All right, so you could ask the how about the internet, right? I mean, these days we all take it for granted, but if you really stop and think about it, enable near instantaneous transfer of digital information between any two points on the globe. Like, wow, how on earth could you ever build a system that does that? So um, that's the how question. And the answer, of course, is with a lot of super, super cool computer science. So if you really wanted to go deep onto this question, you know, you would take a course in computer networking or read, or read a book on that topic. You'd learn about BGP routing, you'd learn about TCP IP congestion control, all that kind of stuff. Um, computer scientists and engineers came up with the initial answer to the how question in 1970. That's when the ARPANET got rolled out. Obviously, as the years have gone on, uh, computer scientists and engineers have come up with better and better answers to the how question as the internet infrastructure uh, has gotten more and more powerful. Now, for blockchains, in some sense, the answer to the how question is very much the same. The way we're going to realize the functionality is through super cool computer science. And if you're someone who does core computer science as, as your research the way I do, you're mostly thinking about the how question. You're thinking about how to solve the technical challenges that come up when you're trying to build a system um, with the computing functionality uh, that you're after. The why question, right, says, okay, it's all, again, it's all fine and good to sort of write down some kind of superpower that a computing system might offer you, but like, why is that interesting? Like, why would anyone actually want that functionality? So you could ask this question for the internet. And in 2022, in 2022, you could walk up to any random person on the street and off the top of their head, they could list off a zillion different, really compelling answers to the why question about why the essential functionality offered by the internet is really a world changing thing. 
They might talk about YouTube. They might talk about online dating. They might talk about social media. They might talk about Wikipedia. There's any number of things that they could enumerate. Now, for sort of younger listeners, I do feel obliged to point out, right? So as I mentioned, sort of the ARPANET sort of rolled out in 1970. It's 2022. It's 52 years. It's interesting to look at the midpoints of that time period. It should be 1996. I was a junior in college, so I was using the internet such as it was at that time. And let me tell you, in 1996, internet had been around 26 years, the answer to the why question was really not that clear. And in particular, none of the killer applications I just mentioned, right? YouTube, social media, online dating, Wikipedia, etc. Literally none of that had been inv invented yet in 1996. You could send emails, you could transfer files, as of very recently, you could render static web pages in a browser uh, like, say, Mosaic or Netscape. So it's not that there weren't any answers to the why question in 1996. There were some, but obviously those answers got much, much more compelling as time went on. Now, with blockchains, we're not 52 years in. We're not even 26 years in. We're 13 years in after Nakamoto dropped the Bitcoin protocol on us. So... Again, it's not that there aren't any answers to the why question. Uh, I do think you know we're seeing lots of interesting projects you know um, use the essential functionality of blockchains in interesting ways in 2022. But I also think it's a really safe bet that just like with the internet, the answers to the why question are going to get much more compelling uh, as time goes on. So, what then is the what? of blockchains? What is the superpower they give you? What functionality do they offer that you, we didn't have before? So when I answer this question, you know, when I speak about a blockchain, what I'm actually going to be referring to is a general purpose smart contract platform. So Ethereum being the best known example, you know, but we now have many other examples as well, Solana, Avalanche, etc. cetera, uh, name your favorite. So in my opinion, the way you should think about a general purpose smart contract platform, you should think of it as a computer, just like your laptop. Okay, except not physically realized like your laptop, rather a kind of virtual machine that sits on top of the internet, but a computer, logically speaking, nonetheless. Now that, of course, by itself may be not so interesting. You probably have a computer in your pocket or on your wrist. Moreover, viewed as a computer, you know, a blockchain is about as powerful as computers that we had 50 years ago. So for them, this technology to be interesting, there better be more to the story. Okay? And there is. So what's remarkable about this computer is that, in effect, it has no owner or operator, in the sense that there's no one in a position to shut it down. I encourage you to think about this sort of virtual computer as running in the sky, in public view, as a public good. So it's an ownerless computer. It's open access, meaning anyone can use it. You may have to pay a usage fee, especially if there's congestion, uh, but you don't have to, you don't need anyone permission. You don't need to be on some kind of special list. You can use this computer up there in the sky, where by use, I mean you can, you know, install new software in the sense of deploy new smart contracts or interact with existing software, meaning uh, smart contracts that have already been deployed to the blockchain. So it's ownerless, it's open access, and finally, seemingly paradoxically, despite the fact that this computer in the sky doesn't have an owner, it actually enables a meaningful notion of ownership for the end users. So if you are an end user of a blockchain like, say, Ethereum, you can own in a meaningful way digital data that lives on that blockchain. By own in a meaningful way, I mean that computer in the sky will enforce property rights for your digital data on your behalf. And I use property rights here in the totally traditional sense of the, of the term. You know, right to use, right to exclude, right to transfer, and so on. And this sort of paradoxical combination, like a computer with no owner that could nonetheless enforce property rights on you, for users with digital data stored on that computer, that fundamentally is what Nakamoto showed us uh, what, how, you know, what we could do with the Bitcoin protocol. Now, mind you, Nakamoto clearly had in mind the specific use case of a cryptocurrency. For Nakamoto, the digital data that needed sort of enforcement of property rights were Bitcoins. Okay, it was a currency. 
But there is nothing fundamental about the solution that means it's specifically for cryptocurrencies. It's for any type of digital data, enforcement of property rights for any kind of digital data stored on this computer in the sky. So that's a pretty interesting combination of properties. I don't know how you would have ever gotten that combination prior to the advent of blockchains. So this combination is the superpower that this technology gives you. So the why question, it's not that there aren't any answers now, but I expect the answers to get much more compelling as the years roll on. For that to happen, two things need to happen, paralleling what we've seen with the internet. First of all, we need better and better answers to the how question. The internet got more and more powerful, more and more robust as the years went on. That was crucial for new generations of applications. Similarly, computer scientists and engineers working on the how question, we need to make that computer in the sky as reliable, robust, and powerful as possible. The second thing we need is we need um, people who can dream up applications to figure out truly world-changing applications that require this unique uh, combination of properties that are offered by blockchains, the unique combination of properties of this computer in the sky. If we can unlock that question, okay, what are the world-changing applications of this new functionality, at that point, Web3 will be able to change the life of a randomly sampled person on Earth, much in the way that, at least in 2022, the internet, you could easily argue, has changed the life of a randomly sampled uh, person on Earth.